Next on our list is cognitive development, and we're going to focus on a uh, cognitive. I think I should spell it right. Cognitive development, uh, and this is going to follow uh, a guy named Jean Piaget from uh, his work was the 1920s and 1970s um, uh, or so. So Piaget, I believe he was Swiss. 20s to 1970s uh, is where his when his field work was done. Uh, cognitive cognitive development is kind of the study of uh, how children develop in stages. So it's a it's a developmental stage theory, um, and it has to deal with how kids figure things out, how they acquire knowledge, how they use it, uh, and how they expand their thinking in various stages. And uh, just like Comrade Lawrence's uh, findings, this is going to be a largely biologically driven process uh, where these stages of development are um, determined chronologically uh, based on your genetic uh, coding and then the, uh, of course, uh, inherent abilities provided uh, in the uh, structure of your brain uh, and that anatomy. And of course, you have the environmental factors too about, uh, you know, the epigenetic uh, gestation factors and, and lack of or access to uh, education, nutrition, stability, all of those factors uh, put together. Uh, nonetheless, there's a basic <clears throat> uh, set of stages that uh, Piaget noted that um, these children would go through uh, until they developed their minds fully uh, to their maximal capacity into, uh, into adulthood. So let's start with uh, how he viewed the process of acquiring knowledge. Um, and this applies more so at the earlier stages, but it, it's how we, we learn and adjust our learning as we go on. Uh, overall. So first of all, and he developed these terms, or at least the ways that, that they are used, um, we have what are called schemata, schemas, schemata. Um, a schemata is essentially your understanding of some form of knowledge, whether it's an object or an idea. So you have a mental picture in your head when I say dog. Uh, you learned that when you were a kid, what a dog was. Like, dogs are defined as, you know, being four-legged creatures with fur, and then they, they can bark. Uh, you know, they have these characteristic tendencies. They look a certain way, generally speaking. Uh, they pant. Uh, they're associated with humans. They like to fetch. Things like that. Uh, those are all little understandings that you've acquired over time and applied to this uh, abstract understanding of what a dog is. Right? You have an abstract... Uh, understanding of what a, a human is too. That's what schemata are. It's, it's essentially your understanding of what a human being is, oh, how they look, generally speaking, uh, how, how typical males and or females might look, uh, or atypical ones, uh, how, um, you know, how they can generally speak, things that they can do, intentions they have, uh, characteristic behaviors, needs that they have. You have all this information uh, applied to this one understanding of what humans are and what they can and can't do. And that applies to everything. So these are basically um, our um, cognitive understandings, understandings uh, of knowledge. And that could be objects or ideas, um, but that's our basic understanding. And those are constantly changing over time because we constantly add new information uh, which can change uh, whatever schemas we have uh, for, for whatever entities or ideas. Uh, and that's the process that he sort of articulates. So you have this, uh, of course, mental representation or understanding of, of any object or, or, or idea or any, anything abstract. Um, but as you grow, these are forced to change because we get into information and we find out uh, we didn't know enough about a topic or we were too generalized or too broad or we were wrong about something. Um, so uh, it's a, it's a three-step process uh, of forming these uh, schemata and then, of course, um, having to adjust that. Uh, so the first step in, in uh, using or applying your understandings to new information is what's called assimilation. That's when you attempt to uh, apply your previous understanding of something like dog, for example, uh, and you try to mold it to what you already know. So it's taking the information you already have, and you have some new info come in, and you try to apply or, or, or adapt that new thing to your previous understanding. All right, so you're not really changing your old um, understanding. You're trying to uh, take this new thing and fit it into what you already know. 
All right, so um, attempting attempt to fit new info into old understanding, your old schemata. So a common example for this one is, um, we give the dog example. Um, at a very young age, you learn what a dog is. My son's 10 months old, he already knows what a dog is. Um, so you, over time though, find out that your understanding of a dog isn't quite specific enough. So here's what I mean. It's typical for, let's say you're in a household that has a dog but no cats. Uh, it's typical for a toddler um, when they've only seen a dog and they know, oh, dog, you know, they realize, oh, fur, four legs, dog. That's their understanding. Uh, and then they see a cat for the first time, right? And so what a, a toddler may do is they may point and say, dog, even though it's a cat. Uh, and you'll chuckle. Uh, but they were, that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to assimilate um, this new information, this cat, with their old understanding, this, their old uh, knowledge of what, of what a dog was. So when they see this cat, they're going to have to make some changes uh, to their knowledge because it doesn't fit. No matter what they do, it, it can't fit. Those are two uh, different creatures. While they may be both, both fur-legged mammals, or, or four, sorry, furry four-legged mammals, uh, there are other characteristic behaviors that distinguish the two uh, as different species. You know, size, behavior, anatomy, all of, that, all of those uh, features. So, next, when it, when it doesn't fit, when my old understanding is not able to fit uh, this new information and I've got to change it. And that's the accommodating process. So it's accommodating, accommodation, there's two C's there. Accommodation. That's when I actually have to uh, adjust uh, my old understanding uh, to uh, apply or to apply uh, new info. So you tried plugging it into the old info or your old understanding didn't work, cats are different than dogs, so now you have to expand your knowledge. So you've got to refine what you understand as a dog. So a dog is now no longer just a, four, a furry four-legged mammal, now it's also uh, you know, got additional characteristics. They're generally bigger than cats, generally. right? Uh, they bark, cats don't bark. Um, they, uh, cats tend to use their claws and have sharper claws and can climb trees easily, whereas dogs generally cannot. Uh, dogs generally fetch and cats generally do not. So those are all things that you can use uh, to uh, accommodate the new information and, and now uh, diversify or, or expand your knowledge of, of a specific topic. So that's constantly going on throughout life. We are constantly taking our understandings of objects or people or ideas, coming across new information, trying to uh, fit that into what we already know and oftentimes that, sometimes it works, um, uh, but the more sophisticated you get, um, the more you understand, or the older you get, the more you understand how sophisticated knowledge is, uh, and there's a lot of accommodation that goes on across the years. That doesn't stop. Um, you, in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever it might be, you're still coming across new information that, that you're not able to assimilate and that you're forced to accommodate for and, and change your understanding. So that's the basic process um, of, of forming concepts and adjusting knowledge. So forming... Uh, slash adjusting conceptual knowledge. That's always going on. Um, however, Piaget did uh, most of his research with uh, children going into adolescence, and uh, he did come across some uh, developmental stages. And that is very much like what we talked about um, the other day with um, uh, Freud trying to lay out a sequence of stages that you must progress through, and if you don't, then you're, you're you know, you'll be abnormal in, in some way, uh, as well as uh, Erickson too, although he was uh, a contemporary of PJ's. Uh, they, uh, they try to, you know, sort of dissect and divide life into uh, stages that you would go through, uh, and Piaget also noted the, the general tendency uh, of, of maturing humans to roughly follow a general time frame. Uh, while the times may vary from person to person, some people achieve uh, or complete these stages earlier or later than others, um, it's generally the same steps. You don't usually progress from one stage and just skip one and go to the next. Uh, you usually um, go through these in sequence because uh, that's how your brain develops uh, in humans. There's a, there's a common pathway to how our um, frontal lobe 
increasingly connects itself and consolidates those connections with the, uh, with the rest of our brain and, and as we take in uh, new experiences uh, and knowledge. So the first stage Piaget sort of laid out was the uh, sensory motor, motor stage, sensory uh, motor stage. Uh, and this pl takes place, generally speaking, between the ages of, uh, uh, of zero birth, obviously, uh, to about two, uh, when you really are able to acquire and use language, like string together multiple words and, and convey meaning well, even if it is telegraphic. Okay, so here, uh, this is where children sort of interact with and figure out the world uh, because they have no language ability, um, or, or it's developing still, it's not quite developed enough. Uh, they figure out the world and how it works through observation. So what they can see and hear, and then what they can actually physically manipulate in the world. So they will, you know, purely figure out how uh, the world works by observing it uh, through watching people and, and what happens to things, uh, how they move around, how people act, you know, what happens when this happens, um, what does this noise mean, what does that noise mean. Uh, or they'll figure out how objects work and, and, and how to get things by physically learning how to grab them, move them, um, and then manipulate them uh, to figure out, oh, if I pull this crank, the, the jack-of-the-box pops out, right? They, they learn that by first possibly probably observing you do it, and then they would try to figure it out themselves, uh, or like fitting blocks into certain spots or figuring out that, oh, I can put smaller objects in larger objects like a cup, uh, or I can take those and flip it over and stack them. Uh, they go through those uh, progressions um, purely by observing, uh, hearing, feeling, touching, and moving, uh, or, or you know, you include smelling too and tasting because they're they're doing a lot of biting of things. But that's how they figure the work out, world out. They, they can't utilize language, uh, so they have to do it with their uh, senses and with uh, uh, movement and physical uh, touch. So that's what this is defined by: um, interpreting world slash uh, comprehending or understanding world world through uh, senses and uh, physical uh, motor skills, All right? That's how they figure it out. Uh, and one of the big markers that children want to get past here is uh, a stage of development or, or phenomenon known as object permanency. Um, and that's just essentially the fact that you know things exist even when you can no longer see them. So what I mean by that is when a an infant or a newborn, or an infant is super young, rather, uh, you can take their toy they're playing with and put it under a blanket. And the uh, infant, if they're young, they're, they won't look for the toy. To, to them, it's just gone from existence. There, there it goes, there it went. Um, however, as they age, and they get more into the four, five, six, seven, eight month uh, point, they will start looking for the toy, at least briefly, when you hide it. Um, and they also, um, since they haven't fully developed the, uh, the concept of, you know, things being out of sight and not existing, they also are, are generally interested in, in, and enjoy peekaboo uh, because, you know, you disappear for a little bit, then you, then you appear again. Not that they think you disappeared, but uh, they don't know what's, they don't quite know when you're going to come back or how you might, how you might act. But uh, as they get older, they get less and less interest in that game because they have a much more, um, sophisticated understanding of, of objects and object permanency. So just, again, just the idea that things continue to exist even if you don't actually see them. So hiding things, going around the corner, doesn't mean you have disappeared forever and the object as it reappears is now a new object that has appeared out of, uh, out of nowhere. All right, um, and then um, once they've sort of mastered this and they're, and they're able to utilize and learn and express through language more consistently, uh, they progress to the second stage which is the uh, pre, um, pre-operational stage. Uh, and this is the stage roughly from age two to seven-ish. Again, this can vary. Um, this is where kids are well able to convey and understand things through language, or they're starting to, um, but they're not really able to utilize any forms of logic. So it, it's a very simple, set of understandings um, that are applied here. So here, give me, I'll, let me give you some examples to what I mean. Uh, first of all, this isn't a particularly good example, but uh, this is where children often engage in what's called symbolic play. Here's where 
they'll play games like house, right? Where there's like a mommy and a daddy and a baby or, or, or whatever, or they'll have a tea party uh, or they'll have a race. Uh, and they'll, they'll engage in the activity, whatever it is, like the, 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 what they see as the norms for that particular activity or person or entity. Uh, but if you go to ask them, so they'll, they'll kind of abide by these rules, right? The, the mommy will do this and the, and the daddy will do this, basically whatever they've seen their parents do. Uh, and the baby does this and the, the brother does this. Um, they'll go about doing them, but if you go to ask them like uh, what the rules are and, and what people do and why, they won't be able to answer that, but they'll be able to actually act it out. So here they're, they're observing and acting out um, and even speaking it, but they can't quite articulate uh, what it actually is. Um, another marker is what's called egocentrism. And this one can be pretty hilarious. Uh, egocentrism is a stage of development. Well, it's not a stage of development. It's a, it's a, a term that, that sort of means or refers to the inability of a, an organism, in this case a human being, obviously, to see the world through your eyes. Meaning they can't understand that you are a different person with different feelings and likes and dislikes. So, uh, for example, this is where a, a, a child might um, see that you're sad, uh, mommy's sad or dad's sad or whatever, uh, and they'll think, they can recognize the sadness, which is another thing I actually forgot to mention that, that I have to elaborate on. Uh, they know that what makes them feel better is uh, their blankie or their uh, doll or their bear, whatever it might be. Um, so what they'll do is they'll go offer it up to their parent who's sad, like here's the blanket, or here's the bear, or here's the doll, whatever it might be, because they think, oh, that'll make them happy because that makes me happy. Uh, but they're unable to realize that, oh, mommy and daddy may not and probably don't like those things. They will certainly like the act of their kid, you know, trying to make them happy, uh, but the kid's not able to realize that they like different things than they do. Uh, and they know things that they don't, uh, or vice versa. Uh, another, um, one of the famous um, uh, experiments for this one was, uh, they tested this by having a, a toddler, like a two or three year old, it's an adorable video, you should watch it, you should YouTube it, um, where they uh, had this toddler uh, sitting on one side of this big volcano, like a, not an actual volcano, like a replica, like you know, like you would do like a project and have a volcano that's like, you know, this big or whatever. So if you're sitting on one side of it, you, you can't see what's on the other side of the volcano. Um, so on one side was like a goat in a tree and a rock or something. Uh, and that's the, the side that the toddler could see. And on the other side, uh, the experimenter, the, the scientist or whatever, uh, they had different things they could see. They could see like a dog and a lake or something like that. But the little kid couldn't see. So uh, the kid could easily answer, what do you see? And the kid would be like, oh, I see a goat and a tree and a rock right over there by him. And then they would ask, what do I see? And then the kid would look, and then he would say, oh, a, a goat, a rock, and a tree, uh, because that's what he saw. So he thought if he could see it, then the other person could see it when they could not, all they could see was the, whatever I said, the, the I don't know what I said, a dog in a lake or something like that. Um, so yeah, uh, it, it's just basically the idea, and if my linguistic uh, re recreation of that was inadequate, here's the volcano. Uh, here's the rock and the goat, which put a G here, I'm not going to draw a goat, goat and the uh, tree, and here's the toddler, uh, and then you have the adult here, and then they have the dog and the lake on this side, uh, and again they ask the toddler what they see, and the toddler would, you know, describe what they saw, and they'd also ask what the adult saw, and the toddler would again describe what they saw, unaware that uh, the adult cannot see over the volcano to, uh, to uh, see those objects over there. All right, that's egocentrism. And uh, as you age, you sort of transition out of that inability to, to see other people's um, uh, perspectives. So um, that is related though to another phenomenon that develops early in this stage. Uh, it can develop here, but it certainly is developed here, and that's what we call theory of mind. Theory of mind. It's more so clearly developed here, though. In fact, I'll actually just put it here, even if it does technically exist partly in here. Theory of mind is when you are able to understand other people's intentions. 
It doesn't mean you can like understand what they know or, 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 or what they think or what they can see, right? That's egocentrism. You can only see your own perspective and understand your own. But you know that other people are not just some random object uh, or a, a, a Barbie doll. It's an actual person. So um, one example is, and this is uh, one of the markers of, of, of somebody who might be on the autism spectrum, is if your uh, child, and this is why I actually am gonna lump it here in the sensory motor stage. This is why your child, even as an infant, and certainly as a toddler, can realize that when you're doing something and you say, oops, they're not going to copy and try to mimic you. So they're, they're always trying to mimic you, especially in the early stages, like if you clap or you put something on the table or you stack a cup or whatever, they're gonna to try to mimic you as they try to learn it. However, if you perform a task, like say you're trying to stack a cup and you say, oops, they're gonna know you didn't intend to do that. They're not gonna to try to mimic you. They understand, they have a theory of mind that, oh, uh, that wasn't his intention, I'm not gonna to try to copy that. Uh, a, a much simpler one is if a toddler or infant follows uh, your eye contact, where your eyes are. So if you look up and then they look up, uh, they realize that um, you are attempting to look somewhere else. Uh, you can also figure this out by pointing to things and if they are directed to where you are pointing, like, oh, look at that, can you get the ball? And like, you know, the toddler looks up there and crawls towards it. They're actually realizing that you uh, are a different person with different motives uh, and, and, and intentions and incentives. Uh, they can also start to realize moods too, like uh, what it means, how to see when somebody is sad um, or, or mad or happy. Uh, and they might also uh, be able to um, understand things they can do to cheer you up. The only problem is at this stage, they'll only be able to understand things that cheer them up. So they can see mommy sad, that's the theory of mine. Understanding you have motivations and feelings and, uh, and, and are a person, but this is the inability to realize you might like things that I don't like, uh, or vice versa, or you might understand and know things that I don't. They, they only think that you like or dislike the same things as them, uh, but they can still read it in you. They know what you're trying to do. They know that you do feel and what that looks like. So that's what uh, theory of mind is, and that's what egocentrism is. Okay, uh, the next ones are, and this is a little bit as you get older, but you can still look for them. Um, Children in this stage don't have what you would call concrete logic. They can't look at something and logically figure out uh, or, or track causation in an event. Uh, and they also can't usually mentally track things backwards. So here's what I mean by that. Uh, there's two phenomena or, or, or terms that sort of describe this. There's what's called centration and irreversibility. These are when, this basically just means you can only focus on one aspect or characteristic of an event or an object or a person and you just totally um, exclude the rest. That probably didn't help you, but I, I think I have an example uh, that can help point this out. And I'll actually, I'll actually uh, talk about irreversibility too after that. So, one of the common experiments to find out if uh, your kids are in this stage, like if they've progressed on to the next one, uh, the uh, concrete operational stage or not, uh, is checking for these two with a particular experiment. Uh, this is one that Piaget carried out himself, where he took two beakers, two glass beakers. Uh, one was um, shorter and thicker, and one was uh, taller and thinner. He asked them uh, which one is bigger, uh, and, the, and the kid would, would say, all the kids would say uh, the tall one, right, because they saw it was taller. But they weren't, they're only focusing on one factor here. They're not considering, oh, well, how much do these beakers hold? Like, maybe this one actually holds more water than that one, um, or, or the same amount. They're not actually bigger, but they just saw the one aspect, oh, that's taller, that means it's bigger. They're unable to apply that to um, any other feature. And also, even if you showed kids this, uh, and, and this is again a test to see if they're still in this pre-operational stage or not. What he did was he would pour um, a certain amount of water into the uh, uh, shorter beaker, and he would take that exact beaker, fill the water, didn't change the uh, amount of water at all, and they poured all of it into the larger beaker. 
And then they were asked something along the lines of uh, which one has more water or which one is, uh, can hold more water or, or whatever it might be. Uh, and the kid, uh, even though it was exactly the same, I should have this full, by the way, uh, even though it's exactly the same, uh, and, and you could see that, uh, the kids weren't able to escape, uh, first of all, that one attribute, which is this is taller, therefore it's bigger, they're not able to comprehend that you can actually size this down and expand it to have the exact same amount of mass, but also they lacked irreversibility. They could not not play an event in reverse. So to be able to know that the amount of water that's in these cups is exactly the same or the amount they can hold is exactly the same, you have to be able to remember that uh, this was poured into this. You'd have to be able to mentally like reverse the um, uh, sequence here to realize, oh, well, this actually came from that glass. And since they both are, are at the max uh, and there was no spillage and there's no extra um, uh, space, that means that they're exactly the same size or they hold the exact same amount of water. To understand that um, uh, they hold the same amount of water. You'd have to, of course, be able to focus on more than one aspect of just the height, realizing that uh, this height can be reduced down and expanded to be the same, but also you have to be able to mentally reverse uh, pour uh, those two objects, uh, or sorry, that, uh, that sequence uh, to, to play it out in your head and realize, oh, it's actually exactly the same. Uh, so that's basically um, what is part of this pre-operational stage. And again, uh, you can transition out of this at different times depending on um, your uh, you know, genes and environment, but um, that's it's generally a sequence you go from uh, sensory motor to pre-operational. Uh, and then, after you uh, achieve this, one of the markers for realizing you've graduated, I guess you could say, beyond the pre-operational stage is actually understanding that the amount of the water in these cups is the same. So let me pick up there with that one. And that is going to be Part of stage three, which is the um, uh, concrete operational stage. This stage is roughly seven to 11, uh, and this is the stage when you can actually um, mentally reverse this process and understand that even though one might be taller, um, they, they can hold the same amount of mass in them actually. So, um, when you're able to do that, when you are able to realize that you can change its form but not change its actual properties, like moving it and changing its shape doesn't change the amount that it is, that's referred to as conservation. Uh, once children have achieved conservation, that's a good indicator that they are have transitioned or are transitioning into this concrete operational stage. Um, so that's one of the abilities. I need to check make sure I hit record. Good, I did. Uh, that's one of the uh, markers of this uh, stage of development. Um, so they're able to understand that. Uh, and another ability they have at this stage, but not in the previous stage, is a phenomenon um, or process referred to as generalization. Here they're able to uh, practice what's called inductive reasoning. Generalization. Uh, this is when they can make generalizations or uh, form understandings based on uh, patterns they, they might see in the world, all right? Um, so, for example, they might notice that, uh, well, for example, men are on average five or six inches, six inches taller than women, uh, so they might notice that uh, men are taller than women, right? But it's really hard for them to understand that um, some men can be shorter than other women, uh, and other women can just be taller uh, than other men, but they can make that observation. Um, but they're not able to use what's called deductive reasoning and um, apply any abstract understanding towards that. Like they don't, they won't comprehend the factors that um, produce height. Uh, and there are many factors, right? There's genes, then there's environment, then there's the nutrition, right? The environment could be the, the gestation period, could be the environment you're growing up, your access to food and, and stress, all those things. They're not able to understand um, how all those factors could result in one being uh, tall or not tall, or men being taller than women on average. Um, that's what generalization would be. So this is a inductive reasoning. Uh, and that is, that is a form of logic. That's what we call concrete logic. It, it's simple logic. It's, oh, I see this uh, as a common characteristic, therefore uh, that, that characterizes uh, or generalizes that group or that understanding. Um, and this is where they can, you know, much more easily perform simple mathematical functions. Um, 
Before age seven, they can already add and subtract, even multiply and divide, depending on the individual. But here's where uh, it becomes easier to divide because there's a simple set of, uh, you know, uh, exactly wrong or exactly right answers. Uh, there's no unknown variables or hypothetical situations. They can understand that do this, then this happens. They can sort of understand uh, the, the correlation between events or uh, general tendencies um, of based on their own observations of the world about boys and girls or dogs and cats, things like that. Um, they are not able, though, to think abstractly, uh, which means they cannot use, for example, deductive reasoning, generally speaking, or it's very difficult for them to. It's rare. Uh, deductive reasoning example would be, um, if I could tell you, if I told you A is bigger than B, Inductive reasoning would tell you, oh, B's are, are smaller than A's, right? So this would be easy to understand. Uh, A equal is, is greater than B, therefore you could tell me B's are smaller than A's. Kids can do that. They can't generally in this um, uh, stage of development uh, use deductive reasoning, right? That's a generalization. Oh, A's are bigger than B's, therefore B's are smaller than A's. Um, they can't use deductive reasoning, though. They can't uh, expand it. So if I were to expand this into A is bigger than B, and B is bigger than C, and I ask them, is A bigger than C, they'd have to use deductive reasoning. They'd have, they'd have to backtrack and reduce uh, the amount of information they knew, the sequences of, oh, okay, so uh, if B is bigger than C, and A is bigger than B, therefore, logically speaking, uh, C is going to be smaller than A, uh, and they'd be able to answer that. Uh, that's very difficult, if not impossible, for them in this stage uh, of deductive reasoning. All right, so that's concrete operational stage. I feel like I'm forgetting one that I want to talk about. Let me double check. Make sure I'm not skipping something. Nope, I'm not skipping anything. Uh, I just noted that, uh, and I've already mentioned this, this is where egocentrism begins to dissipate. So, for example, I'll even write that, why not? Uh, ecocentrism uh, diminishes. It doesn't entirely go away, but it diminishes because they can't think in hypothetical gets, which we'll, we'll get to in, uh, in stage four on the uh, 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 formal uh, operational stage. So when I say it diminishes, it's not perfect, but they can still realize other people's perspectives, like they know things that I don't know or vice versa. So for example, if uh, one of the common examples is uh, if they're reading a comic book uh, and you got a character, Jim, he uh, uh, hides his uh, money under the bed. Then he leaves, leaves the room, uh, he goes away, goes to work, whatever, my, whatever he might be. Uh, so, but then leaves. And then uh, his wife, Jane, uh, takes that money, uh, moves money from under bed to the safe, um, they will understand that when Jim gets home, Jim doesn't know that, right? So this is where they understand Jim doesn't know. So that, that's a step above. Uh, before, they would, since they saw it happen, they would think Jim also knows it. But now they understand, oh wait, Jim wasn't there. So even though I know Jane moved the money, Jim, according to this comic, doesn't know that yet. All right, uh, that's, that's sort of a, a step up. So it's not entirely perfect, uh, but it is, uh, they do have an increased ability to extend their perspective and subjective understanding of the world uh, outside of themselves. Okay, so the last stage then, is the formal operational stage. Formal operational stage. This stage uh, is basically adolescence, uh, but we'll, we'll put 12 uh, to adulthood. And we know now, cognitively and biologically, that this, is, um, this maturation process is largely initiated and later completed by the, the increasingly uh, developed and interconnected and consolidated frontal lobe, uh, which finishes in your mid to late twenties, generally speaking, uh, based on the individual. Uh, and because you you have that intact, you get a whole host of new abilities uh, that weren't available to you or weren't 
thoroughly available to you uh, in previous stages. So this is where your um, judgment improves, your um, ability to, for, for goal orientation and planning improves, your impulse control improves, although it's not done, of course, until you're in your, into adulthood. Uh, but all these things start um, developing further. So the three main qualities here that we'll talk about uh, are these, the following three developments that, that are indicators that you or your child or whoever has reached this formal operational stage. Um, and again, it's usually around puberty when this occurs. So first of all is the ability to uh, partake in, in what's called abstract thought. So you don't have to just think about concrete events that do or don't happen. Um, you can actually use deductive reasoning, right? Like what we mentioned before. So if I tell you A is bigger than B and B is bigger than C, you could also tell me that A is bigger than C because you know that B is bigger than C and A is bigger than B, so therefore A is bigger than C. So you have deductive reasoning, so that's possible, deductive reasoning. Uh, but they can also think in hypotheticals now. What I mean by that is they can, uh, they can sort of think about what they want to do and what the consequences of those actions might be. Like um, a kid who gets an impulse earlier to, to steal a cookie, um, they don't really think about how to cover up their tracks uh, or, or uh, they might not think about the possible ramifications of, their, of, 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 eating, this, of eating this cookie especially if they don't answer. They might know that they'll get punished, but they're not gonna be able to think about different ways they could take it and go unnoticed or, or, or cover their tracks. Uh, or, you know, if you give them a, a, a possible that they don't know, they can think more so about what the ramifications might be. So if I, if I treat my friend this way, what might happen? Like, how might my friend react? How might my parents react? How might their parents react to me being mean to my friend or being nice to my friend or whatever? Or how would other people in my circle of friends react to me being nicer or meaner to this, this, this guy or this girl uh, in my circle of friends? They can think uh, abstractly beyond that. So it's not just like uh, um, simple concrete events like if this happens, this happens. They can think if this happens, all of these things could happen. Uh, and then they can decide what they want to pursue based on those consequences, and their ability to think about that uh, is improved. Uh, here's where else they, they are able to... Adolescents are still pretty egocentric, like most of the thinking is generated around themselves, but they can actually understand other perspectives. Like, they can understand why you might do something, uh, and that helps them understand these hypotheticals too, like, if I do this, then that might cause this to happen, or, or this attitude to emerge out of this person, so I shouldn't do it, or I should, or whatever it might be. Uh, they can think hypothetically, and they can utilize deductive reasoning. They can also uh, utilize a, uh, a concept known as metacognition, which is thinking about thinking. You're like, what? Here is where they can actually understand um, where they might have errors in their thinking. Uh, they can actually analyze their own thinking methods about Am I thinking this through all the way? Have I considered all of my options? Um, perhaps I need to do more research on this topic. Um, what, are the, what else might be an example of, of metacognition? Uh, here's where they can understand things like what I'm teaching you guys. Uh, they can understand what a confirmation bias is. They might be able to think, oh, well, maybe I'm wrong because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm suffering from some sort of perceptual bias uh, and, and I'm like, take me in information that supports my evident, my perspective, and I'm, I'm dismissing or rejecting, even perhaps unconsciously, uh, you know, evidence to the contrary. This is where they can actually weigh in how they're thinking about things and if it's effective and if they should improve it and what they should alter as far as their thinking process goes. Uh, it becomes possible here. You can't do that in the concrete or previous um, uh, operational stages. You're not really able to analyze how effectively you are thinking and what you can do to expand uh, or, or improve that. Uh, and lastly, oh, problem solving becomes far more so sophisticated. So not only can you play things out in your head and can you analyze your own thinking about the effectiveness, but uh, you can sort of merge um, problem solving. Uh, so if you're trying to figure out something, how to make somebody feel better, or how to get a better grade, or how to fix a computer, or how to change your room for the better, or how to um, you know, 
become faster, better at sport, whatever it might be, uh, you're able to think about how to do that and experiment with it uh, yourself. So uh, you're able to utilize trial and error. So you're able to think about your thinking, analyze your, your, your logic, your use of logic, uh, and, and think about hypothetical outcomes, and you're able to test them out. Be like, okay, let's see what happens when I do this. Uh, oh, okay, that didn't work. Why didn't it work? It probably didn't work because of this. Okay, let me try it this way instead. And you're able to apply it that way. So you're able to merge trial and error plus um, your logical uh, thinking. So trying something out, that didn't work. Why didn't it work? How can I adjust it? And you're able to go through that problem solving process uh, together. And that's essentially what that formal operational stage is. Uh, and that's the normal stages of development. And again, uh, Piaget laid them out. Uh, he pioneered a lot of the terminology uh, as far as cognitive uh, uh, development goes and cognition goes. Um, but understand that the ages are not set in stone, so you can progress to them uh, more slowly or quicker than others. Um, but what is generally true is you don't skip stages uh, for the most part. Uh, you might have elements that are absent or undeveloped if you have a psychological disorder like you're on the autism spectrum. For example, in your dorsal medial frontal cortex or ventral medial frontal, frontal cortexes aren't uh, developed fully or they're abnormal in some way, so you lose your theory of mind and you're forever egocentric. You, you see other people as, you know, just objects. But you can still um, systematically think about things and problem solve. Um, other than that, and, and and related disorders that are similar to what I just described, uh, you have that progression. Uh, and perhaps maybe people don't reach a certain phase, or they don't get as far into a certain phase, but they generally, again, don't skip them. You don't go from sensory motor to uh, formal operational. There's a, there's a progression as your brain matures, changes physically, and that changes your uh, abilities um, and, and behaviors as well. So that's Piaget, and that's cognitive development. And then we'll talk uh, next about moral development, and that'll be it for Unit 6. We'll move on to Unit 7, which is motivation, um, uh, emotion, and personality.